early recovery is a super vulnerable period for everybody involved, for the person who's in early recovery and for the family who's in early recovery, which is why we are so lucky today to have, I call him an expert witness. We've got Scott here who is in family recovery and who is also a family recovery coach. And he's here to share with us some of his experiences about the major pitfalls that can happen especially during like times of transition and what to look forward to what's a reasonable expectation and how to navigate all that without everything falling apart because i do think transitions that's where people fall through the cracks all right scott talk to us about it well uh having gone through uh two sons that have been i don't know somewhere around 10 rehabs themselves so we've had several transition periods uh, and then also volunteer uh, at a rehab for the last two and a half years as a as a parent coordinator. So uh, have quite a bit of experience with families transitioning through through rehab. And, you know, certainly um, there's a couple of different situations. You may have a spouse that's in rehab that normally is going to uh, transition back to your home. Uh, hopefully, if it's your child uh, that they may not transition, especially if they're over you know, 20, 22 years old. Hopefully they don't transition back to your house. Hopefully they transition in an apartment or somewhere with other sober living uh, individuals. Uh, but it's a hard time. And, uh, you know, I, uh, you hear the fact that the first the hardest 30 days of rehab many people consider are the first 30 days. Uh, but many people will consider the second hard, hardest 30 days of rehab is the transition period. And so I think, uh, you know, I think we got some tips and tricks today to talk to families about. Uh, because what, one thing we want families to understand, what is the rehab talking to your, uh, to your addicted loved one about, about their transition, so that if we know a little bit about what they're hearing and what the, what the rehab is working with them on, on their transition, maybe it'll help us handle it a little bit better. Absolutely, because I, I do think there's this, there's this competing pressures going on with the person trying to manage their recovery. And then, you know, and all the anxieties that you have as a person in early recovery mixed in with all the anxieties that your family has. And sometimes that can collide. Yes. And so I'm going to say that's, that's a number, that's our first big pitfall that can happen in early recovery is, is understanding each other's perspective, right? Exactly. Okay. So well, I'll let you talk to us about the family perspective on that. And I'll talk to us about the addictive person perspective on that. We'll, we'll try to cover both bases here. Sure. Well, mm -hmm. you know, with, with the family, obviously it's a very fearful time, right? You kind of got to relax, hopefully during the few months or weeks, however long they were in rehab, you, you kind of got to take a little bit of break, right? Because they were handling it. Except and when all, they were calling, begging you to come get them every 30 <laughs> true, minutes. Exactly. Besides that. Was good. <laughs> Besides that, hopefully you got to relax a little bit. But during, you know, when they are transitioning out, uh, you, your, your fears certainly go way up because you don't know how it's going to go. Um, and, and so what happens is we kind of relapse sometimes as parents. Right. We've been going to our program. Hopefully we've been learning what we need to do during all this. And then all of a sudden transition happens and we kind of relapse and sometimes want to get back on the roller coaster of the craziness that we were in before they ever went to rehab. And that's what we absolutely don't want you to do. Uh, we want you to, to try to relax. It, it's a weird time, right? Uh, especially if it's a spouse moving back in the house and maybe they've been gone for six months. It's a weird time for a few days. It's even weird, you know, if they're not living with you because it's just, it's different. You're kind of getting back into hopefully a normal, so-called normal routine. Uh, but just maybe identifying the fact that, hey, this, this is a little weird for me as a family member. Um, but you don't want it to be so weird that you're walking on eggshells and that you're acting totally different. And now all of a sudden you're raising their anxiety and it just kind of snowballs on, on the whole family. Right. And I think on that point of the, the weirdness that you're making, which is just so true, I think it's, and I say this all the time, it's like both sides don't trust the other side. Yeah. So both sides are watching the other side, like, exactly. like but, for, but we're pretending to be nice. Yep. <laughs> which I'm for pretend to be nice. I say yeah. keep doing that. Try to pretend to be nice without being awkward. You exactly. Know? Can you just be casually pretending to be nice? It's okay to pretend to be nice because sometimes that's what you got to do to get back to neutral, right? Exactly. And so that's that weirdness, right? It's like, what do we talk about? What do we bring up? What, what do we say? And both 
angles feel that, you know, is this coming from both sides, not just the family, but from the addicted person too. Yeah. Well, I thought you brought up a good point, Amber, when we were preparing for this a little bit, as you were talking about how, uh, you know, during transition, certainly some, depending on the rehab, but they may actually have them, uh, have the addict uh, read their recovery plan to the family. Uh, they may actually give the recovery plan to the family. So you see it in writing and stuff. Um, but, but I think sometimes the family thinks, okay, I'm going to be the monitor of this recovery plan and, and I'm going to make sure that you follow it to a T. Well, that doesn't work. Uh, what the rehab is telling them is that you you have to own your own recovery. So that's up to your loved one is to own their recovery. We can certainly be supportive and loving and kind and nice, like you said, through it. Uh, but if we start trying to manage that and monitor it and own it ourselves, it's it's not going to be good probably right. it's going to cause some issues i find that as far as like those plans and stuff are concerned recovery plans expectations are usually a little too high on both sides actually yeah because when you're in rehab well a couple of things one thing is and i worked in a facility so i'm gonna tell y'all this is how it goes this is behind the scenes like they have you fill out those recovery plans so they can put that in the chart and they can prove they told you what to do and not to do okay yeah. so you need to understand some of that big old written out thing is a treatment center thing okay not that the things on it are not true but but what ends up happening is it's like you you help the person develop these big fabulous plans that just sound like wonderful i'm gonna meet your day i'm gonna call my sponsor down i'll meditate three times a day i'm gonna I, whatever you know and it's just like not doable yep. now sometimes the person that's in the rehab like they know that especially if it's not their first time and they just know they're filling out the form so they don't even mean it <laughs> sometimes the person means it like and they and they're just kind of like in a pink cloud and they think i'm just gonna do this it's gonna be great but then they read that to the families or the families see that as part of like the discharging process usually. And then the families think, okay, this is the plan. And then as soon as that person comes home and they like miss the meeting or they miss their meditation, one of them or something, that's where things are going to fall apart. <laughs> that's when things go bad. Well, you and I talked about one, one of them in the planning process is like uh, one of the things that the uh, rehab is talking to the addict about is staying in a routine. So they've been at a routine probably in their in their program and they talk about staying in a routine. That's obviously positive for any individuals to have some type of routine. Uh, but certainly they're talking to the attic about that. And then as soon as the attic comes home and sleeps till noon on a Saturday, it's like, oh, my God, he's relapsed. Well, that, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's not the case. They're not maybe going to stick to the routine every day. Uh, but certainly the rehab is talking to them about a routine. They're talking to them about don't give your your family or your roommates reason to worry about you. So like if they, you know, in the first few weeks, if they're leaving the house, it's it's courteous for to say, hey, I'm going so and so and I'll be back at nine or nine thirty tonight just to kind of in the in the So the attic understands that the family may be a little uptight about this, about them leaving or their roommates. Mm -hmm. So I think the addicts hearing this. So we don't as family members, we don't need to ask them where they're going, who you're when are you coming back? All that kind of stuff just raises the anxiety, makes you feel like you're now the monitor and the the what the craziness that you did before they ever went to rehab starts to trickle back in. But Scott, what if they don't do that like the rehab told them to do? That's okay. Then is That's, it okay? It, <laughs> it, ask? It's it's their recovery, right? So we can. <laughs> As much as we were the police and the monitor before they ever got to rehab, we know how that didn't work pre rehab. It's not going to work post rehab either. So no, uh, those things do not seem to work. Just like you do not want them going back to any of their old behaviors. You are responsible for not going back to any of your old behaviors. Cause what happens is, is when one does, it triggers the other. And then it's just like a, a back and forth feedback, like so bad cycle. So, Exactly. Even if the family drops off, starts acting crazy, doesn't mean you have to get on a road coaster and vice versa. If, yeah. if the other side won't get back on, it won't last long. That's right. But if somebody falls off, whichever one does first, and then the other one falls off, oh, Lord, here we go. We arguing, we're fighting. We're like, screw <laughs> I'm just going to get high because you think I'm going to get high anyway. And then it's just like. It's back on. on. It's on. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. So understand that 
plans are important, but also have a little flexibility to understand that plans never go exactly yeah. as we think they're going to on either side. <laughs> Yeah, I think patience, you know, I, 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 yeah, I think patience is a big key here. We got to have patience they, and they, they have to have patience as well. But um, I think as a family member, patience is a big, it's something that ought to be on the forefront of your mind during that period. Right. Now, Scott, another thing I know you were naming was in, in one of the big high risk, dangerous situations is just triggers. Yeah. And, and looking at understanding your triggers and how rehab, you know, if someone's in a program, they're talking to you about those things. Yeah, you, you, you certainly worked on that during your weeks or months in rehab, uh, right? And so uh, normally in a recovery plan, there is a lot of information in there about your triggers, identifying them and writing them down even maybe and having a plan for them. And the triggers could be around money. It could be around the phone or social media. It could be around uh, a, a, a bad set of friends or it could be around a, a girlfriend or a boyfriend. So those triggers are identified. And, and believe me, the rehab has talked and worked at length with your loved one during the, the recovery period on those triggers. So for us as family members, we don't need to, to ask about, you know, who are you, if you see them texting over there, who are you texting? Or who did you just get off the phone with? Or when they leave the house, are you gonna see, you know, Joe Bob, uh, the, the, bad, <laughs> the bad guy that uh, he maybe had before? try to stay away from all that because believe me if if they're going to work their recovery and they're going to be successful in recovery they've got a plan to avoid all that right um, and then there's other ways like you know one of the typical things we hear is that okay now now that they're home they're working and now they've got money oh yeah um what do we do about the money do do i do i need to help manage their money um if any of those things that we talked about being triggered, especially money, you know, I, I was the one that used to go on and look at Zach's phone bill to see, I, I could look at our phone bill uh, at six o'clock in the morning. I looked to see who he was texting at night, who he was calling. And I certainly looked at his account and I, I could tell where, where things were going wrong. So if Zach asked me to manage his money coming out of transition, I'm not the person to do that because it would draw me right back in to be in that monitor. And, and I would probably now go on his account 15 times a day to see, oh, God, he just spent $10 at the convenience store. I wonder if he bought Kratom or I wonder if he bought you know, something wrong. So um, you can use other people to do that. Uh, it, could be a, it could be a sibling, but more important, it's up to that addict to get somebody to support him in that. Maybe it's his sponsor. Um, there's also other app, there, there's things or, or uh, there, there's cards out there. There's one called TrueLink and mm -hmm. it's specifically for addicts that, that they, um, they actually can't use it at convenience stores to buy alcohol. Um, they can't withdraw money at an ATM machine. There's things that might help, uh, you know, help be that transition period for them uh, to give them a chance to have more right. success. If to they, provide if the there, accountability, and but you don't have to do it. You don't have to be the accountability, right? Uh, we all know if they want to go buy drugs, you can get them true link. You can get them everything in the world. They're going to go get it if that's what they want to do. But right. there are some things that might help, uh, you know, help them guard against some of that. I think as the, as the family, we're so concerned with what the other person's triggers are. It's easy to get involved in trying to manage their triggers. Exactly. But you need to make a list as a family member. What are your triggers? Exactly. <laughs> And you need to manage your triggers. Like maybe what, like what Scott is saying, a trigger of his was managing the money. Yeah. So managing the money may be a trigger for the addicted person, but it's also a trigger for the family member. So you kind of got to like differentiate whose trigger is it and whose responsibility is it to manage it, you know, on both sides. Well, you know, Amber, we, we encourage families too. like we obviously encourage families to get into support groups, whether it be Al-Anon or, or, or your local, you know, some type of local family support group. Um, I know when Zach first went to rehab, I never went to a family group because I didn't have any issues. He was the one that had the problem and I was sending him off to get him fixed. Well, obviously, I learned along the way that I had some things to work on and how things that I needed to, to, to improve and how I was adding to the chaos. Um, and so. But, but the second time around when he went to rehab, when he got out, I kind of quit going to my family group because I thought things were better. He had been gone for six months and I didn't think I needed it. Um, it's just almost the opposite, I think, um, especially during that transition period. Certainly is a time for you to, uh, as a family member to continue to work on you. 
uh, so that you that's where your triggers are going to come. That's where your triggers. Out. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so being able to go and talk to other families during this transition process, I think, is really helpful. So I think families don't need to forget that they they need to continue going uh, to their program. Right. We call that, you know, man, taking care of your side of the street. Right. On, exactly. on both sides, taking care of your side of the street. Exactly. Now, Scott, another bucket of things I know you were talking about that can go wrong is, is relationship stuff because of all that uncomfortable tension yeah. that's happening and that awkwardness. There's some relationship pitfalls that are that you got to watch out for. Yeah. One, one of the uh, questions we get asked about a lot from families is um, <laughs> if they hadn't made amends with you yet, uh, let's say they come back home and they've been home for a couple of weeks. I want my apology, Scott. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And they, you know, they haven't apologized for wrecking uh, four cars and uh, all the money that they've cost you. Families start to get uh, maybe a little resentful of that. And they're like, well, either he's either he's hadn't got either he's got hadn't got to step nine yet. So that means he's not working his AA program. And uh, should he have apologized yet? What what I've learned uh, over uh, my boys making amends or not making amends is that just let it go. If uh, at the time that it's right, they'll make amends. It may be that they're already work step nine, but they're so shameful. They're so full of guilt over how they've hurt you. They may not have come to grips of how to come talk to you yet. So just let that go a little bit. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're not working their steps. It doesn't mean that it's not on the forefront of their mind. It just may maybe mean the timing is not right for them yet. Right. And, and so it would, rather than us building up all that resentment and getting so worked up ourselves, I think we just have to let that go. I want my apology, Scott. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I'm still waiting on a few and it's been a, it's been a few years. <laughs> Another thing you said, I thought that was a really good one, Scott, was just that um, the family wants the person to talk about the recovery a lot yeah. to the family. Yeah. Well, I can uh, I can tell you that uh, many rehabs might be uh, telling the addict otherwise. Uh, a lot of times as family members, we're too emotional about it. Right. And we don't have the experience of going through that ourselves. In most cases, sometimes families do. But uh, in my case, I did not have the experience. Um, but sometimes, yeah, the, the uh, you know, the addict certainly has their avenues to go talk to. First and foremost is their sponsor. Uh, secondly, they hopefully they're going to some meeting on some occasion and they certainly have their their AA group or whatever meeting that they're going to. Um, but the addicts certainly don't want to talk about rehab in most cases. Now, if they do want to talk about it, I think it's good to, to lend that ear and listen to them. Right. Uh, if they but, do want to talk about it. Do not be sitting there waiting for them to say one wrong thing and pounce, because that's the surefire way to make sure they don't talk to you about it again. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But, uh, but for, you know, for the most, I, I would say the majority of addicts don't want to go into a lot of detail about the, the six months that they just spent in rehab. Uh, it may take a while or they may never talk about it, but I think it's normal for, again, I want parents to know it's normal for a counselor maybe to be talking to them and saying, Hey, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be sharing a lot with my family because they're they're too emotional about it. And, 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 you know, certainly during rehab, as you know, as a counselor, they've probably told the uh, counselor for the last six months how crazy mom and dad were during all this. And uh, certainly they don't want to get back into <laughs> into talking about well, that. I see families say this a lot. They say. If you want to drink, if you want to use, just pick up that phone and call me. Yeah. I think that's ridiculous. Sorry, family. <laughs> Yeah, I I don't even tell my clients that because yeah. if somebody wants to drink or use, they're not going to call you. And if no. they were going to call somebody, which they're probably not, it is not going to be you <laughs> as the family member. They will call me before you. But, exactly. but even then, that's like a, a long shot. So, and then and plus, it's like if they tell me they want to use, I'm just like, dude, I know. Right. Like, you know, and and we <laughs> talk through it. If they tell you they're wanting to drink or they almost stopped at the liquor store on the way home or something. You're just going to, it's going to trigger you. So yeah. think about number one, do you really want them to tell you? And can you handle it? And don't be upset when they don't tell you. Cause that's the thing. Why are you telling me? Like, exactly. <laughs> be real. You know, on that maybe on the other side of that is, is, uh, you know, certainly I think a lot of times they, they've been taught during their recovery. A lot of times is to take some time alone, uh, maybe meditation, certainly internal thoughts, 
um, how to, because I, I know like with, with Zach, he, he was one of those guys that he never wanted to be by himself. And, and because obviously he was trying to, he didn't like being by himself. That's why he tried to you know cure some of it with alcohol and drugs, but certainly they try to teach you how to be by yourself, uh, and, and maybe meditate, those kind of things. So if they do come home and you see that maybe, well, he's never went and sat in his room for an hour. Well, maybe he's meditating. Maybe he's doing internal, you know, uh, uh, thoughts, working on himself, getting his mind uh, clear, working on his recovery. Now, certainly we don't want him to isolate for days, uh, but just sometimes parents, I think, get a little worked up about maybe seeing a little bit uh, of a change. Maybe they're right. trying to spend a little bit of time alone. So that's in nothing. Room, they got the door shut, Scott. What should I do? Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're so fearful, right? We, we almost kind of want to keep that eye on them 24 seven when they first get home. And mm -hmm. um, that doesn't seem to help. I, I just think the big message is on both sides to the best that you can try to have some kindness, understanding and grace for the other side. Okay. Yeah. And I mean that for the person in early recovery too, like your family is going to mess up too. Okay. I'll tell you family, your person's going to mess up doesn't mean they're not going to get it. doesn't mean that nothing's wrong. Your family's going to lose it too. They're exactly. going to snoop. They're going to tell you a lie. They're going to tell you they did not drive by that meeting when they did. Yeah. And, and I just want you to forgive them for it. Okay. Yeah. Like you just, let's have a little understanding on both sides. Best we can. And that will help us continue to move forward instead of get stuck and backtrack into that badness, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Totally agree with that. Let's see if anybody has some questions. Let's see what kind of questions they got. You guys got for our expert witness here. Let's see. Mickey has a question. It says, "Question for family members: When a loved one relapses, what should you do or not do? If we ignore it, they keep going. If we say something, it can go either way. Very hard to stand back and suffer through it, for sure, Mickey." Yeah. All right, Scott. What you got on it? Well, relapse. I've certainly been through a few. Um, and, and certainly made my mistakes going through some of those. Um, I think what you have to realize as a family member that um, relapse can be part of your journey, right? It's, it's not going to be a straight line. There's going to be ups and downs and relapse may be a part of that. Um, I would try to encourage uh, your, your loved one if they do relapse that, hey, you, you've done this before, right? You, you, you went and got treatment before or you, you, you figured out how to stop before and go get help and just encourage them that they can do it again. Um, not, not shame them, not belittle them, not tell them how, you know, Oh my God, you've, you know, I can't believe you've done this. We just sent you to six months of rehab and here you have relapse. That doesn't help. So shaming and, and all that, I would definitely stay away from that. I would just right. try to encourage them. Right. I go into damage control um, mode, Mickey. And I actually have a, a good uh, video. I've got a whole, um, playlist on relapse, but there's one uh, video specifically that talks about what to do as a family member when you see that. And your job is to, to really narrow it down to something simple, not to get back on the roller coaster with them. Yeah. You don't have to ignore it. Right. But if you go crazy, you, you're just going to speed it up. Yeah. Right. And believe me, the first few times it happened to us, I kind of went crazy and, and I didn't help. Um, but I learned after a, a couple, um, again, you, you know, you're not, you're, you're not supporting it. You're not condoning it. Uh, but you just, in my opinion, you just have to be supportive. I know uh, the last time Zach relapsed was really bad in, in an OD. And, um, you know, I, I could just tell that he obviously didn't, he didn't, he didn't mean to, to go and relapse and almost die. Right. Um, and, and all I was is just supportive. And I said, Hey, you're, you're the, you know, you're the only one that can fix this. I love you and I'm here to help in any way, but you're the only one that can do this. Right. Uh, but I, I tried to be supportive and just let him know that I loved him. You know, even um, last, I think it was like last Thursday or Friday, maybe I got a, I have a client who works out of state or whatever, and uh, he struggles with alcoholism. And I got a text from his girlfriend and she said his name was, we'll call him Scott. Scott's at the bar again. I don't know what to do. And I saw that message and I almost just had to breathe myself because I was upset for her because yeah. I mean, this guy's done so well and, and I, and he's just got so many good things going for him now. And I was just upset for him. Cause, it, cause immediately, even as the counselor, I just go into that, like, God, I just see so many people lose everything for this. I don't want him to lose his girlfriend. Who's so great. Don't want him to lose his job. Yeah. I had to like 
wait for a minute before I could even answer her back. And then I had to remind myself, it's not, it's not the end of the world. This guy's done great for yeah. like nine months. He's had two lapses in nine months. And so yeah. I can't, even in my own mind, think, oh, it's over. You know? Yeah. And I have to remember it's my job to talk to him and be like, dude, let's get back on track. Like, it's yep. not, like you lost a day. Okay, now we're, we're, we're back in the game. You know, that's our job. We well, you know Amber had a sim- control. we had a similar case uh, last week with a family at at, at the rehab that I volunteer at, and, and it was a forty something year old that has relapsed a, a few times, but he he uh, he relapsed a few months ago, but he got right back and got back going again, and found out Tuesday night that he had relapsed again, and I felt so sorry for his mom. Um, she was devastated again, but she actually took it better, and she said, you know what. He did this three months ago and then he went three months sober. So I feel like he's going to go three months sober and hopefully even longer this time. So it, it does hurt. It kicks you in the gut. But I think, you, have, you know, you have to be positive. You have to say, hey, you can do this. Right. Because if you're the person that's having the relapse, if you in your own mind start thinking, I've screwed it up now, I've blown it, I've ruined it, I've got to start all over, you're going to keep going. Yeah. And so the first thing I try to do as their counselor is say, uh-uh, you have not scared it up, but please, yep. like, you didn't even get a DUI this time. Like, come on, <laughs> get back on track. Exactly. And as the family member, that's what I want you to do, too. I don't want you to go into that because I'm trying to get them to fight that thought. Because when they have that, they get the, I call it the efforts. And then that's it's right. on. Now it's like a full-blown thing. Yeah. So it's containment. Yeah. It's containment. Yeah. All right, let's see. My son continues to lie about so many things. He doesn't even need to lie about. <laughs> I tried to step out of the way. He's doing a lot right, but still doing a lot wrong. How do I handle that? You know, uh, my son used to, I, I've literally caught my son. I would, I, he would call and say he was at McDonald's when he was at Hardee's and he was merely only eating. It didn't matter. You know, he would lie about what, fast food restaurant he was at and it didn't make any sense. So the lies is a big part of it. Uh, it's habit. It's habit. You're so and, used uh, to garden secrets and making sure you're like, no one knows what you're doing. You, it's yep. just like literally automatic. And it takes yep. a while to make that stop. It takes a while. So, you know, if they're in early recovery, they are probably going to tell you a few lies. Doesn't mean that they've relapsed. Doesn't mean that they're they're heading for a relapse. Now, again, if they're if it's constant lies, then maybe that is a little bit of a warning sign. But are they going to continue to tell a few lies? Sure, I, I, right. that takes a while to get out of. I've got a, a video I just recorded. It's not out yet, but it's about when to call the lie out, when not. Yeah, because it's not always necessary to call the lie out, people. Right. Most time, not. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and I also want to say this too, families. Let's get real now. You know you're still lying to them too, because you know you're still sneaking and stooping and doing some stuff you shouldn't know. <laughs> you know you didn't tell grandma and you told them you didn't tell grandma and like all that stuff. So come on now. Let's be fair. <laughs> yeah. We don't do that. We don't lie as parents. Ever. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We had we had a couple in our office, me and Campbell have family session this week, and the the spouse had thrown away the um, the substance. And the person was so mad. She's like, I can't believe you lied to me. You lied to me. I'm like, dude, you lied to him. You said you didn't bring it in the house. I'm like, both of y'all. I'm like, it's like, who's li- Who's the liar? I'm like, everybody, let's stop. Everybody. Yeah. Yep. All right. Let's see here. We are in a cycle where our loved one commits to a 60-day program, then relapses around the 30 or 45-day point never quite getting past 60 days. And then she leaves treatment, comes back to detox, tries again. Then she tries to do it on her own. And the cycle continues until she sees her life is unmanageable. And we'll try again. This time we hear her saying, I'm just done with recovery. I'm tired. Can you speak to this thought pattern from your experience? Yeah. um, You know, I obviously don't know all your circumstances, but I think, um, even though we tell parents to be supportive during relapses and all, we certainly shouldn't um, help the consequences. We shouldn't deter the consequences. Whatever consequences happens during their relapse should be 100% on them. Hopefully that's something that helps them not to want to repeat it. Uh, so I don't know. I'm, I'm not saying you guys are, are uh, you know, taking away the consequences, but I, I don't know the situation. But um, 
certainly habitual relapse. Um, we, we see that. Um, and sometimes it's hard to get, get them from doing that, right? They get in that cycle. Uh, I think all we can do as family members is support them however we can. Um, it does come to a point is how much money do we want to spend on continued re, uh, rehabs? I've mm -hmm. been through about 10. Um, I got to a point where with my first son where I said, this is the last one. And um, I think I meant it. Uh, luckily, I didn't have to get tested. Uh, he's been sober three and a half years, but but I I hope I meant it. And uh, we're at a point right now with my stepson where we're we're at our last rehab. And I hope I mean that as well. But I, I guess the point is, I think as family members, it doesn't mean we have to send them to rehab every time they relapse. We can I think we ought to do what we can do. Uh, mm -hmm. And maybe that if that's only loving them and, and supporting them emotionally, then that's all we can do. Right. Joe, Joe, what I would add to that, because Scott's giving you some super good advice there. The only thing I would add to that is just as far as the actual thought process the person's having, that's just an addict thought. And if, if that person were sitting in front of me telling me that, I'd say, dude, that's just your addiction. Sitting there telling you not to even try because you're never going to get it. Yeah. That's just some baloney that your illness is telling you. And then here's, and then what I would say next is I'd say, did you get 45 days? You did not get no 45 days by accident. Yeah. Right. Like if, if your daughter goes 45 days, she was trying hard. Okay. Yeah. And so now some people go out and they use the first day out. Then they done known that long before they got rehab, they've been planning it. They, they done call somebody to meet them. Like, yeah. but if you go 45 days, you were trying hard and probably, and that's me. I don't know anything about the situation, but probably, there's one thing that your loved one either really just doesn't want to do or doesn't want to quit doing. And it's usually like a relationship or a job. It's usually just this like one thing they don't want to let go of and they keep trying to do recovery, but hang on to this thing. Yeah. And, and it's that thing that keeps tripping them back up. Maybe it's like, I'm really trying to stay sober, but I just don't want to go to meetings. I'm really trying to say so, but I just want to keep my boyfriend. It's just probably like one thing. If they're getting 45 days, they're getting it and they got it and they are working it. And that's what I would reinforce because the addiction is trying to tell them, you're never going to get this. It's, I'm like, mm -mm, that's some bull. You done, you done had it. You're 45 days. Dude, that's great. <laughs> one other thing too, Amber, is I've been told by this by a few rehabs is that that seed has been planted um, in multiple seeds, if, if they've done this multiple times, if they, if they've attempted rehab, they've had some recovery seeds planted in them. Uh, a, a counselor told me one time that my, my boys may have to go out and fertilize that seed with alcohol and more drugs before it actually starts to work. And they certainly did. Uh, but, but it did work. Eventually they got it. And, uh, so I, I would just say that they, that seeds planted in there and, and we just hope, hope and pray that, uh, She'll get oh. you know, 60 days, 90 days, a year, two years, and, all, and just stay sober. I mean, unfortunately, it takes a few times. And I hate to say this, but it's just the truth. But first few times, whether it's rehab or talking to Amber, whatever, I'm going to tell you how it's going to work. Yeah. And you're going to either not believe me at all or you're going to believe me up to a point. But <laughs> you're going to try to customize what I'm telling you <laughs> because you don't want part of what I'm telling you not to be true. And you're gonna have to prove that a couple of times before you really get it. And that's that seed. Like I'm gonna tell you, you're not gonna believe me. That's cool. I'm not even gonna get upset. But, but don't be mad. I said I didn't tell you. Like that's not gonna work. Like. But it's kind of like when you told me eight years ago that your your program was the the IOP was not good for Zach. It was not gonna work for Zach. But let's try it for a few months and just see. And it, I think we tried it for about sixty days, and he never passed a drug test. He never passed a breathalyzer test. It did not work for him. But you told us from day one that that was not the right level of care. It was a lot of fun, though. <laughs> That's a funny story. I didn't want to hear that. When, when you told me that, I didn't want to hear it. We, we kind of enjoyed him, even though it was a mess. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see. Let's see if we got any more questions here. Y'all had some good questions. Um, let's see. It sounds like it takes lots of micro decisions to decide to place alcohol in one's body. I like that micro decisions. Very true, especially when um, 
when you're trying, you're actually trying to stay sober. Um, I always say like, if your if your addiction can't get you to use right away, it's not telling you like, go get high or whatever. It's just telling you to go on that street. <laughs> yeah. You, you need something from that store over there. You know, it's exactly. like that. Get, let me just get you one step closer. Yep. I call it the long game. Let me get you one step closer. And the, the stronger your recovery is, the more sneakier the addiction gets like that. Yep. Yeah. Yes, for sure. Well, the addictive brain certainly works on them. I, I remember Zach, you know, a few times when he would relapse, it is, it's like he had to go get something from his old friend's house, uh, like a pair of shoes or a hat he left. It wasn't that he was going over there to get high, but just so happened that when he went over there to get the shoes, guess what? He actually started using again and relapsed. So the brain, the, these, like you say, these micro decisions, the addiction works on their brain, something right. terrible. Now, sometimes the person knows that's exactly what they're going to do. They're just telling well, exactly. them. Exactly. And other times the person's telling themselves they're going over there to get their hat. Right. And then I, and, you know, they might tell me like, did you know? And they're like, you hey, know, I get my hat and lunch. And then I, and then I'll say, I'm, when you come back, I'm going to give you that. I told you so. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm going to give you that. I told you, so. you know, and then we just kind of like laugh about it or whatever. So, yeah. All right. If, if anybody out there um, wants to talk to Scott for consultation or ask Scott questions or any of our family recovery coaches, I have put a link in the description. And also, Scott has got a very good sort of list of do's and don'ts that he's created for parents. And that link's in the description if you would like that as well. Up next for you guys, I've got more videos on how to navigate those early recovery, those first few weeks and months, the hard part, how to get through that successfully. All right. Bye, everybody. Thanks for being here, Scott. Bye, guys. Thank you.